Welcome everyone again, and thank you for joining us today for a fireside chat on the impact of menopause on women at work. I'm Katie Schubert. I'm president and CEO of the Society for Women's Health Research, and we're the thought leader in promoting research on biological sex differences in disease and improving women's health through science, policy, and education. An estimated 6,000 women in the United States reach menopause daily, with 51 being the average age. For many individuals, hormonal changes that take place during the menopause transition are associated with physical and psychological symptoms, such as irregular menstrual cycles, hot flashes, vaginal dryness, mood fluctuations, sleep disruptions, and cognitive challenges. And these highly variable, variable symptoms are often not recognized to mark the menopause transition, and that results in inappropriate management and potential disruptions of day-to-day -day activities for millions of women. Menopause is a life stage that all women of a certain age will experience, and with approximately 44% of women in the workforce being older than the age of 45, menopause symptoms can uh, have been reported to affect up to 20% of the U.S. workforce. Increases in retirement age and life expectancy are putting a demand on workplace settings to recognize the far-reaching economic, social, and healthcare impacts of menopause on women's health and society at large. So in recognition of National Labor Rights Week, SWHR is hosting today's fireside chat to discuss the challenges that women experiencing menopause symptoms face in the workplace and explore some strategies that employers and supervisors can implement to improve workplace environments for midlife and menopausal women. And we're so pleased to have two amazing panelists joining us today, Omi Shade, Bernie Scott, founder and CEO of Black Girls Guide to Surviving Menopause, and Dr. Talia Varley, Physician Lead of Advisory Services for Cleveland Clinic Canada. I'd also like to thank the sponsors of today's event, Estellas Pharma, Bayer, Nutrafol, and Pfizer, and remind everyone that SWHR maintains independence and editorial control over our program development content and work products. As always, we are live tweeting today's event. We invite you and encourage you to join us using, using the hashtags SWHRTalksMenopause on all social media channels. And with that, and at this time, I'd like to introduce SWHR's Chief Science Officer, Dr. Irina Ninye, who is moderating today's fireside chat. Thank you, Katie, and welcome everyone. Allow me to further introduce our panel of menopause experts, and you can turn on your camera. Omishide Bernie Scott is a Black Southern, seventh generation native North Carolinian fe feminist, social justice advocate, and storyteller. She is the creator and curator of the Black Girl's Guide to Surviving Menopause, a multimedia project engaged in culture and narrative shift work through the centering and curation of stories from Black women women identified in gender expansive people. This project is a direct result of Omishide finding herself and her peers living at the intersection of social justice movement work, creative healer identities and aging. Dr. Talia Varley, you can turn on, is a primary care physician with subspecialty work in addiction medicine and chronic pain, who's practiced across inner city and rural settings at the front lines of the opioid crisis. Her clinical research and interests include women's health, healthcare systems and management, and women in leadership development. As a physician lead of advisory services at Cleveland Clinic Canada, Dr. Varley develops strategic plans, corporate policies that center talent management, risk management, and health and wellness opportunities for women's health, guiding employers to be more mindful and inclusive in their engagement of all employees. As you can see, we are set up to have a very engaging conversation. And while we've prepared certain topics to cover, those of you who are tuned in live are invited to submit questions throughout this event. You can do that using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And we will try to address as many questions as we can during the program, especially submissions that will cover reoccurring themes or questions with broader applicability to our audience. Please note that our conversation today is intended for educational purposes and not intended or implied to serve as a substitute for medical, professional, or legal advice. So let's chat. <laughs> and so um, thank you for joining us today. And I guess, um, Omishide, we'll kind of start with you. Um, what symptoms did you or, or are you still experiencing during, during your menopause transition? And how do they impact your work life? 
I always get asked this question, and I think it's a really interesting question. I, I started thinking about my menopause story um, initially around my perimenopause experience, which happened when I was in my late 30s, early 40s. But because menopause is not a spontaneous event and is actually connected to my um, menstruation story, I think that my menopause story began on October 31st, 1979, when I started my period. I had a period for 33 years. And so for 33 years, every month, except for the two times I gave birth and the one time I had a pregnancy loss, my body was talking to me every month. Omi, you're sleepy. Omi, you're good. Omi, you might be pregnant. Omi, you're not pregnant. Omi, you have a cold. You don't have a cold. Omi, you have a yeast infection. You don't have a yeast infection. Every month for 33 years, my body would tell me, it's time for your period. And then I got to a period of time in my late thirties where that communication between my body and my menstrual cycle started to get really wonky. I was like, why is this coming on so quickly and staying for a day? Why is it coming on and staying for three weeks? Why have I haven't seen it for four months? It was like this really interesting kind of shift in the communication between my body and myself and my understanding of what was happening. And it wasn't until I was pregnant um, at 40 and I experienced a pregnancy loss. And when I had the miscarriage, my OBGYN at the time, who's now retired, used language that I had never heard before. She used perimenopause. And I was like, wait a minute. I know, I know what menopause is, not deeply at that time, but I knew enough but I never heard of perimenopause. So when people ask me the question about my symptoms, I, I was flying blind in the dark for probably quite some time. And because this conversation is also about work, it made me think reflectively about where I was in my late 30s, early 40s, and what I was experiencing in the workplace. At the same time, my body was shifting the way it communicated with me around what was happening, what I needed, and how I could be um, in a different relationship with an, an aging body, with a, a, a menopausal body. I did not have a lot of issues necessarily with menopause. And um, because of the culture shift work that we do with Black Girls Guide, I really want to express that every person has such a different experience. It, it depends on the individual. It depends on their culture, their family, where they live. There's so many factors that impact that. So I try to stay away from, you know, the horrible stories and also that it was great. It's, it's your experience. And so my experience was like, my experience, it wasn't terrible. Um, but I also did not feel prepared, not in the way that I felt prepared for my first period. And of course, because I was born in 1967, my first period happened in the 70s. And I felt like a lot of the education and preparation um, that I needed, that my younger sister needed, we were the beneficiaries of the civil rights movement and the women's movement. And so there was a lot of really good education happening in the school system. And my mom was a registered nurse. So I felt very prepared for my first period. I felt mostly prepared for both my boys to be born, but I did not feel prepared for menopause because menopause is more than hot flashes, is more than night sweats, is more than brain fog. Um, menopause is this really um, important transformation from an identity that I moved with for 33 years to a new identity that I'm still learning about and embracing and understanding. And so I don't know if that answers your question, but I also wanted to remind myself, how long have I been working? And I got my first job. Um, I got a worker's permit when I was 15. So I've been working for 41 years. That's a long time to be working too. And working and navigating all of the things that you navigate um, as a person who identifies as a woman, um, as a person who has buried both her parents, as a person who's gone through a divorce and put a child through college, as a person who has a 31-year-old and a 15-year-old. You know, there's a lot of um, interesting stories and memories around workplace 
connected to me as an individual. And I'm glad that we're having this conversation today about this. Thank you so much. And, you know, it's interesting how you mentioned, I love that you were not as prepared for menopause as you were for your first period. And, you know, just how we think about it and how we, you know, process this part of aging. And so Talia, you work in this space on the clinical and research side. And so I'd almost want to flip it. How, because our workplaces don't seem to be prepared for menopause the way that they're prepared, for example, pregnancy, a bit more prepared for pregnancy um, as they were, you know, 10 and 20 years ago. And so can you kind of talk us through or share, you know, why should it be a higher on the, why should menopause be higher on the priority list when it comes to workplace HR? And what are some of the implications, economic or workforce based, that you have come across in your in your work? And it's a great question. I think we're seeing, or at least starting to see some more stats around just how significant menopause can be, you know, when it comes to women, the workplace, economic engagement, and overall financial health. Um, numbers range from one in 10 menopausal women quitting to one in four or even four in 10 considering quitting due to symptoms. And these are really significant numbers. Um, quantifying the economic costs of menopause and, and women's economic participation, not straightforward as you can imagine, but we can think about it and break it down into different cost types. So for example, extensive and intensive margins. Extensive margin costs would be things like women leaving work or losing their jobs because of symptoms. Um, intensive margin costs would be around women staying at work, but then really trying to cope with the problematic symptoms. Um, and it's important to highlight that these costs aren't just being borne by women themselves. They also impact women's partners, their families, their employers, and wider society. Um, and some of these costs are easier to estimate than others. You know, it's easier to calculate lost wages related to someone leaving a job than it is to um, really evaluate and put value around, you know, self-esteem that might be lower around leaving work. Um, and for things that can be directly estimated, some of them are related to symptoms like, you know, and clear like lost wages around quitting work again, but if it's indirect, like a lost promotion opportunity, how do you really put a number around that? So our evidence is limited around the exact cost, but we are seeing some really important data points emerging even just earlier this year from a recent Mayo Clinic study. Um, and that actually showcased that menopause costs American women around $1.8 billion in lost working time per year. It looked at things like hot flashes, night sweats, mood swings, a variety of symptoms, was you know, one of the largest studies of its kind in the US across thousands of participants, multiple sites. And the stats were pretty staggering. You know, about 15% of the participants were missing work or cutting back on hours because of their symptoms related to menopause. Um, those who reported the worst symptoms were 16 times more likely um, to have challenging outcomes versus those with the least severe symptoms. And about 1% of folks, you know, they had symptoms that were so debilitating, they either quit or were laid off in the, you know, really recent preceding six months. And so they basically took that information, extrapolated to get the sense of an annual loss in the US, but all things being equal, it's likely that that's actually an underestimate of the real economic impact, right? Because it's so hard to quantify. And I think one other point that's really important to mention here is that those researchers also found that menopause can have a greater effect on black and Hispanic women uh, who are working. And so black women in their research tended to have more menopausal symptoms, higher percentages of black women and Hispanic women reported um, more adverse work outcomes related to their symptoms. So taking a step back, we know there is a robust business case being developed for employer intervention. And you know, certainly there's the economic piece that should make it a priority for HR, uh, DEI, sustainability and risk. Uh, but we also need to think about the strategic implications when it comes to retaining top female talent and diverse talent in our workforce. You know, that is... Um... I think that's really important because a lot of times menopause is looked at a as a burden or, you know, it can be challenging to want to share challenge, health challenges, and whether it's menopause or something else in your workplace, because you want to be seen as competitive. You want to be seen as, you know, um, not making any waves, right? There's, of course, some 
some, you know, social cultural implications there. And so actually I, I want to kind of follow up on some of that with you, Omi Shade, and, you know, your menopause experience and your advocacy work engages individuals from a diverse spectrum of workplaces and settings and industries, especially that are beyond the corporate sector, right? And so office settings, we always traditionally think of what it would look like, you know, when it comes to maternal health care, postpartum, when it comes to all these spaces. But when you're dealing with um, women that might be working in a factory or shift working, or if you're a bus driver and you can't stop your route to manage a hot flash or symptoms, or if you are, um, you know, in healthcare or a caregiver, right? Um, or nursing, you you know, if you're a doctor and you're performing a surgery, what happens if you are having brain fog, you know, across these different industries? So, you know, is there anything that you would like to share on the behalf of individuals that, you know, you might've worked with or shared some stories? I know because you have your podcast and all of your work, what, um, here's an opportunity to kind of highlight that story that might not be heard. Yeah. So I'm a little bit of a history nerd in addition to being um, a social justice advocate. So I want to invite some folk from history into the room with us. I'm sure Talia has probably heard of some of these people and some of the folk who are listening in today might know of these people. These are women who have been very active in labor rights work in this country. So Grace Lee Boggs, um, Rosina Carruthers Tucker, Polly Murray, who's also from North Carolina, Durham, specifically where I am, Sue Co. Lee, Lucy Parsons, Emma Tanayoka, Louisa Moreno, Mildred Davis, Christine Smith, Lavinia Cooper. These are women historically who have been involved in labor and civil rights movements. So I said these names so you can go look them up, right? because we have a very robust history of women being active in labor and civil rights movement work in this country, protecting the rights of the workers, um, pushing for legislation, um, pushing for legal recourse to protect a, a protected class of people who had not been, to protect the class of people who had not been protected previously. So we see this um, with the ending of the enslavement of Black people in this country and trying to figure out what it means to be a citizen in this country. And then how are citizens protected across the board around workers' rights, around housing, around voting, and around education. These things are not happening in a vacuum. I do find that many of the conversations that we're having about workers' rights are about workplace and menopause or workplace and reproductive justice focus exclusively on corporate America. But I would like to invite us to consider what is the experience of the low wage worker, the hourly worker, the worker who works in the gig economy, the domestic worker, the entrepreneur, the worker who works for a nonprofit, a worker who works in higher education or philanthropy, or a worker who basically works a part, as a part of a cooperative. So there are some resources um, and history and contemporary policy change that we can look to as an example of what we can do around menopause. Specifically, the president signed is the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, right? So that was signed back in December, but it just got activated June 2023, literally six weeks ago, right? And what did that do? It extended the protections for pregnant people in the workplace for accommodate for reasonable accommodations, right? So what does that look like? When I was pregnant in 1992, I was harassed by my employer. I worked in higher education. I was an assistant director of admissions and I was treated deplorably. Fast forward to 2008, I was working for an economic justice nonprofit, pregnant with my youngest son completely different cultural environment. And also because we were doing economic justice, I was treated so well. Like the needs that I had as an advanced maternal age person, I had to stop working when I got about mm, 33 weeks, I had to go on bed rest. I didn't have any issues. I could work remotely. Um, I still was able to get my work done. I would come to the office once a week to meet with people in the office to get work done, not a problem. I was able to be on maternity leave for three months. 
And then when I came back, we had a room set up for me so I could express my milk. That Those experiences were worlds apart, right? 16 years apart. It's a huge difference. So think about also the difference in what pregnant people experience now from 2008 to 2023 with the passing of this legislation. We don't have to cut from new cloth when it comes to policy protections for menopausal people. We have a lot of history around workers' rights and labor rights in this country that we can look to. And we also have recent legislation that are protecting workers who are pregnant. So we, we have a lot of information out there that we can actually look to that can support us in thinking about how we formulate policy that cuts across industry, cuts across sectors, and takes in consideration the needs of our, I think I use the language that Talia used, our talent, the, the people who are working in corporate America who may be in executive senior positions and the domestic worker, right? Who is low wage, um, who have, you know, there's the National, National Domestic Workers Alliance who's been fighting for protections for domestic workers for years. They have a domestic workers bill of rights, right? And what do they want? Fair pay, safe work environments, and protection from discrimination and harassment. I think that's the same thing that menopausal people want. Fair pay, safe work environments, and protection from harassment and discrimination. So I think it really um, serves us to consider how we work across class, how we work across industry, how we work across gender identity, when addressing the needs of menopausal people in the workplace. Um, and there are some other resources I'll lift up real quick. There's a great book by Jessica Gordon Nimhard called Collective Courage. And it talks about the history of black cooperative economics in this country and, and co-ops and co-ops being um, a viable source of worker protection and that women were essential to worker co-ops. Um, another one is the Black Workers for Justice um, they're a North Carolina-based group that started in 1981 based on the experiences of three Black women who were working for Kmart in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, which is a very rural area. And so as a result of that work, they've been doing all kinds of amazing policy work, policy protections for low-wage workers, Black workers, formerly incarcerated workers. So I lift this up again, and you know, I was really excited to be included in the development of the workplace survey that we we put out and there's so much rich information coming in from that survey why it was important for us to make sure it was a very diverse set of questions and a diverse population of people that we wanted to get that information from because if not we could fall prey of remarginalizing people who are already working at the margins and we don't want to be complicit in doing that so this is an invitation to bring people to the center Awesome. And um, Talia, I wanted to, the, uh, there was a question that came in that I wanted to allow you to expand on from what you had mentioned earlier about uh, Black and Hispanic women and some of the, um, the, the disparities that are, that have been observed and noted as far as their menopause symptoms, but also their impacts on work. And um, from your, from your understanding, um, where where does some of that disparity lie? Is it because of inequities? Is it um, biological based, or is it more cultural? Or you know, if you can kind of expand on where what you what you know about these disparities and how they affect these women of color. Yeah, and it's a great question. I think it's one that we're still you know trying to get a, a concrete answer to. You know, as an example, we. Um, saw some recent data similarly on Indigenous women, I think between the ages of 15 and, and 55 in Canada, and, and similarly real um, uh, challenges around health inequity, but they were very much um, related to elements of, yes, access, but also duly, you know, some very unique um, challenges faced by that segment of the population for, for historical reasons and beyond, right, just in terms of um, different types of health risk factors. Um, across different ethnicities. So, you know, in this Mayo Clinic research, you know, what happened was they really just looked at the data about sort of reported adverse outcomes, um, negative outcomes at work, and uh, those in relation to menopausal symptoms. Hard to say if those were just more frequent, um, you know, because of those um, 
you know, individual backgrounds, or if there might be some access issues, right? Because if we think about things like workplace accommodations, if we think about things like, you know, access to hormone replacement therapy, benefits coverage, certainly a lot of that will play into some broader health, um, you know, equity conversations that could certainly influence the data. Um, but I'm not sure that they drew a very specific conclusion in this case. Thanks. And um, yes. Yeah, I wanted to jump in really quickly. Um, and I wanted to, um, I'm not a doctor um, and I don't play one on TV either, but I am a reproductive justice advocate. And I wanted to jump on something that, that Talia said um, that I think that there needs to be um, a call for more intersectional research that takes in consideration the impact of, um, what is it called? Your allostatic, is it your allostatic load? Is that what that's called, Talia? Allostatic, am I saying that correctly? Yep, yeah, yeah, also. Yes. Okay. So, yeah, so um, when you think about the hormones that um, bathe our body, right? So when you are, um, before you're menopausal, estrogen, progesterone, all these things, right? Bathing everything, your brain, your eyes, your teeth, your skin, your reproductive organs. And of course, when you go through menopause, all of these things start to shift. There are also stress hormones like cortisol and adrenaline. And this is not... Um, this is not anecdotal information. There's been so much research done on epigenetics and um, how the stress that is passed from generation to generation can have health, you know, impact on your health outcomes. So this is not um, me making things up, even though I'm not a doctor. So I do think it's important for people when they pose the question about the, um, the different experiences of people of color, of people who identify as black, as indigenous people, other people of color who don't identify as black, to take in consideration of the context of how they might be impacted by racism or homophobia or classism. Um, th those things, if you have a, a persistent raised cortisol level and a persistently raised adren adrenaline level, it certainly will impact your hot flash. Um, and so I think that our opportunity to again, look at the research that's been studied around stress and racism, stress and classism, stress and violence, stress and other hormones and how that might impact who you are and how you're experiencing menopause. And to think about the intersectional research opportunities that might be out there for us to do a better job of pulling that information together. Because what I wouldn't hate for people to think is that, which is not true, that there's something physiologically different about Black women, Latinx women, Indigenous women, or other women of color, because that's not actually true. We, we physiologically, because race is a construct, we are not dissimilar. But we are dissimilar in terms of who we are culturally, who we are ethnically, who we are in terms of where we live, our educational backgrounds, our social economic backgrounds, and those things play a role. So I, what I wanna encourage us to do is to not compartmentalize menopause outside of the context of a person's full lived life and to remember that their personhood and all that goes along with that, working is one of those things, can certainly play a role in how they experience menopause and in the workplace. Thank you. And, um, and so actually, I want to take this opportunity to um, hear from those who, well, in another way, we, we're getting questions and, and filtering questions, but we wanted to take a quick poll of those that are online today. And if you pop it up, um, we want to know, in your opinion, what challenges, what do you think is the greatest challenge women, working women, face during their menopause transition? So, um during those years of the menopause transition, we know that, well, we, you may not know, but if a, if, a, if an individual has certain surgery, they may have a quicker, it's automatic menopause, or, you know, there's not necessarily years going through that transition, but um, your body has gone, has had that change or that depletion of estrogen. And so for this question, it's in your opinion, um, which, which of the following is the greatest challenge you think women, working women face during the menopause transition is experiencing physical symptom disruptions, or is it experiencing emotional cognitive symptom disruptions? Is it um, a lack of awareness about menopause among their colleagues and employers that is their greatest challenge or insufficient work policies for menopause and health accommodations? 
So again, what it's completely a thing. You don't have to come from research. <laughs> and so we just kind of wanted to know what do you think is was a challenge? It might have been something you faced or something from your colleagues or someone that you know, physical symptom disruptions, emotional cognitive symptom disruptions, lack of awareness or education in the workplace or insufficient policies. So we'll give about another 10 seconds and then. Yeah, okay. Awesome, we can turn those results. And so it looks like the emotional cognitive symptom disruptions um, over 36%, followed by physical symptom disruptions, um, workplace policies and awareness. And I mean, as, as we're aware, it's a combination of all of these. Um, and so we do want to touch on those, but um, we had the survey that Omi mentioned earlier that SWHR had posed that looked at menopause in the workplace and it not just um, surveyed women, it also surveyed employers and colleagues so we could get a insights that were kind of 360 in being able to look at how does menopause impact those who are going through menopause, but also those that they're engaging and they're working with throughout that transition in, in post-menopause. Um, and so with that, I actually wanted to, um, because we know it, there's all these different levels, what, um, what does support look like in the workplace, right? We have a question that came in, what does menopausal support look like in the menopause, um, in the workplace? We know for pregnancy, for example, there's these rooms and things of that nature, you know, um, and even what conversations, actually, you know what, let's take a step back. What conversations or practices um, do you think contribute to stigma and bias against women that are aging and going through menopause? Do you want to start there? And then we can talk about um, fixing it. So, um, and this is for either Talia or Omi, I guess, whoever wants to do it, you kind of. This yeah. is a really important question in thinking about how we view, understand, respect, or value aging women in our society, right? Like that's a that's a whole other conversation we could have, right? That could take years for us to kind of dig into our understanding of aging and getting older um, and the perceptions that we have around aging women and also the, the connection to our own mortality and um, how that is also um, addressed, accepted, understood, um, revered or not revered. Um, so I do think that culturally, there are a lot of ways in which we think about older women. There's all kinds of stereotypes we have about older women. There are all kinds of stereotypes we have about menopausal women, right? Um, we are, we are thinking about an angry, tearful, hot flashing, can't find her keys person, right? And we play it up, you know, for some reason, you know, you need levity. So sometimes it's funny and sometimes it's not. And I think that a lot of the protections that we wanted to put into place, there was a question in the chat about what do accommodations look like? And I think this is a really good and important question because we're not just talking about um, legal legislative accommodations in the workplace. We're also talking about a shift in workplace culture. And that a, a shift in workplace culture requires a commitment of leadership for that to happen. Because you can have all kinds of protections in place. This is why people do social justice work. This is <laughs> because we not only are fighting for the policy change, we're fighting for the consistent policy implementation and maintenance and an adaptation. Because the policies that were in place when I was a kid or when you were a child or when Tali was a child, may not make sense to be in place now. So we're always thinking about how we're evolving as human beings, how we're evolving as individuals, how our families are changing, how our workplace environments are changing. And that means it's also a cultural difference. And so it's important for us to have the conversations like we're having now. Um, it's important for there to be education. Um, I, some people will call that civic education, political education, whatever you might want to call that. Um, it's important to engage the workers, to have the workers speak for themselves, um, to talk about what they're experiencing in the workplace and what their needs are. So what the accommodation might mean for me as a postmenopausal person would be really different for someone like Austin Smith, who we interviewed for the podcast. Austin is now 31, but Austin went through medical menopause as um, a trans person who was 
you know, experiencing menopause because of gender affirming surgery when they were 29. So what Austin's needs were of being a trans black Southern person who was now menopausal and my experiences as a 56 year old postmenopausal person were different people. So we want to think about what are the broadest kind of nets that we can cast that offer protection to working people across class, across industry, across sector. And then also what is the educational work that we can do that supports a shift in culture and understanding of workplace culture and what it means to have a workplace environment that um, is in service to creating a culture of belonging that is safe that is fair, that is equitable. Those things are really critical to part of this conversation because if we're just keeping our eyes on the prize of policy change and not also thinking about the importance of culture shift work, then we really have a huge gap in implementation and protections. And we see that happening with people who do all kinds of policy work. It's like, it's one thing to pass a policy, it's another thing for the policy to become a part of the culture of the work, right? So. really really aligned with everything you shared Omi and um you know I, I often think about a stat because you know numbers tend to change hearts and minds in the business community and so as we think about by 2030 there's a stat to say that 25 percent of the female population will be menopausal making it the quote fastest growing demographic in the workplace and so if you are you know an employer you're an organization you're committed to DEI um initiatives and your workforce and your business that means the topic of menopause should be openly discussed, destigmatized, and supported. And so I think you know your point on organizational culture, um, like it's huge. It is a critical part of solving for women's health in the workplace and for menopause in particular. Um, and the evidence base stresses the importance of org culture on shared values, beliefs, and norms. You know, women need to feel supported, feel that they can discuss, you know, their symptoms that are impacting their working lives and their personal lives um, with managers and colleagues alike. And we've seen data on, you know, research from semi-structured interviews, women in different sectors, occupations, you know, finding that practical and emotional support from colleagues, line managers, HR staff. That really matters for women in menopause. But Australian and UK survey and interview data shows us that women prefer not to bring these types of issues into the workplace uh, due to a feeling of potential for unconscious bias that could result in you know, disadvantaging their career in some way. And then that unfortunately can really reinforce that you know, um, culture of silence that they might already be experiencing. Um, and so, you know, where we see more likeliness for women to speak up about symptoms, that's where they feel that they have empathetic colleagues or managers. And so ultimately improving an understanding of gender specific periods of a woman's life, including around menopause and its possible effects on the workplace, that can be actually quite central to related cultural change initiatives. So really starting with education matters. But beyond education, you know, mandatory DEI training that covers gender and age and, and menopause specifically can be quite helpful. Um, and this could include management training and sensitivity and listening skills. Um, it can also cover reasonable adjustments to account for menopause. So to Omi's point, you have the policy, but how do you actually implement that? And how do you actually upskill people on how to understand, engage with, and bring those policies to life? And so this could, um, we've even seen suggested training for police officers um, where they uh, recommend looking at, yes, menopause, but also what are the challenges that men face it? as they age, like prostate problems. And so how can you think about really normalizing gender and age specific health states as workers age regardless and sort of having menopause among the topics that you might address? Um, we've even seen uh, initiatives you know, around occupational health campaigns in workplaces to increase staff awareness of difficulties that women um, might face during menopause to be able to challenge negative stereotypes. Um, these campaigns sometimes focus on education uh, for those midlife women themselves to manage their own health during the transition period, prepare them for symptoms that they might encounter at work. Um, but you can also explore provisions around um, the ability to get connected with confidential, tailored, and specialist advice. 
um, around um, menopausal related symptoms. Some research even argues that OCK health units um, you know, could provide medical checkups and advice for women in this stage. But again, that confidentiality, direct access is quite critical without needing to necessarily be referred by managers if the cultural piece um, is being parallel passed on in addition to these kind of policy and sort of structural initiatives. I think the the word that just keeps popping up in my mind is empathy and the idea that one, um, it's a life change. You know, menopause is not a disease. <laughs> it is a life stage that someone will undergo due to hormonal changes in their body. So whether it is early on, like you mentioned for the gender affirming, or if it's through a, a, a surgery, so maybe an oophorectomy would be remove the ovaries that are largely um, responsible for producing that reproductive estrogen. You can go through menopause or enter into menopause earlier at whatever stage, or if it's through the life transition and you have the perimenopause, um, um, that women will enter or individuals will go through. So it is a life stage that is associated with certain hallmarks and characteristics and, and also vulnerabilities with aging and with other health conditions due to that lack of uh, the depletion of estrogen in the body. And so I think empathy and understanding that this is a challenge, it's a vulnerable time frame. no matter how you enter menopause, it's a very vulnerable time of life. And, um, we have to be sensitive to that. And so it behooves us to be sensitive to it because when people are affirmed in how they can walk in this world, they are their best version of themselves. They are stronger employers. They are um, productive citizens and are productive individuals in the community, not citizens from um, um, status. But, you know, it's like productive in their communities. They give back. They are able to be um, a stronger and a better version of themselves. And so, you know, we're, we are coming at time and I wish we could, you know, go and continue to go with this conversation. But as we wrap up, I do want to get some final words from um, you guys, Talia and Omi, because we get women and general audiences, we get researchers, healthcare providers, we get industry, we get policymakers that tune into our events, whether it's live or they watch it on our website later. And so I want to ask you each, what is one tech takeaway that you would recommend to one of those groups or broadly to everyone um, to help them better support women um, in the workplace through their menopause transition? Really, not even just understand, but how can they support? If you wanted to kind of, this is the hill, and you say, if you don't remember anything else, remember this. And I said, we'll start with um, Omi, and then we'll go with Talia. Ooh, the hill that I want to die on is that you're working with people. <laughs> you're working with human beings. And there's a very interesting way in which we strip people of their humanity, depending on their race, their gender, their sexuality, their class. We, it's just a very interesting way in which we, um, society, culture, will strip someone of their humanity. And I think that the conversations we're having around menopause in the workplace, around menopause generally speaking, and the connective tissue to menstruation and to period tax and reproductive justice and reproductive rights is reminding people of the humanity of everybody, right? Like one of the best things that you can do with people who work with you or for you is to remember all of their humanity. It's, their, it's the context. I have a team of folk that I work with. We are a Black women-led intergenerational team of people. We are cis and non-binary. We are straight and queer. We are folk who have multiple degrees and folk who have not finished college. We are grandmothers and people who don't want to have children. We are ranging in age from 22 to 56. Actually, 57 because the oldest person on our team just turned 57. So it behooves me as the leader of the group, as the founder of this entity, to see the specific humanity in all of the folk who are part of my team. And then I don't compare Taryn to Lee because Taryn isn't Lee. Taryn is Taryn and Lee is Lee. And so what Lee's needs might be in the workplace are based on who she is as a human being. And that's important to me. So it also is a function of how you, as a person, understand interpersonal relationships, 
values, what are the values that ground your work? What are the ethos that drive your work? And we can encourage people to explore that. And there are resources out there to help people deepen those practices because it's not a one-off. Being in a praxis of treating the folk that you work with and for well is a praxis. It's, you don't graduate from it. You're always being reminded of someone's humanity. And I think that's one of the most important things that we can do is to be reminded of the humanity of workers. Natalia, I don't know how to follow that one. I think the inspiration level was <laughs> down up here on that one. So maybe we'll take a, a bit of a different tact, and, um, you know, with some some more on the tactical kind of uh, employer practice side. You know, a lot of my work is really around translating the clinical into the corporate and really creating the case for change, either with numbers or, or really with compelling evidence basis there. And, and so I think my message to anyone in the employer space, you know, considering mobilizing on uh, women's health initiatives in the workplace and in particular around menopause, you know, uh, there is no one size fits all approach when it comes to women's health in the workplace. And again, with menopause in particular, um, there are going to be wide variations in these employee experiences. And that's why culture, flexibility, tailoring of solutions where appropriate can be uniquely helpful and not just for women. Because we know that male colleagues can benefit directly from workplace information and advice about menopause too. Study data shows us that workers are better able to support their female spaces through menopause. They even saw themselves having you know, reduced stress levels as a result too. So as you think about the overall business case and the why, I think don't always limit yourself to what seems to be a direct connection. There are tons of indirect um, value cases around, you know, really focusing on the DEI elements, retaining the best talent, and really engaging women workers throughout their entire life cycle and those who are, you know, in their world supporting them as well, including their spouses, family members, kids, and beyond. Thank you so much for that. And you know, it's it's that balance. There is data and evidence and there's anecdotes yeah. and stories. And together they really make that difference. And that's where we are able to get a fuller picture of, you know, the experiences of one that can help to explain pieces of experiences for many. And so as we put them all together, it, it becomes um, a story that, that we need to, to share. And so I want to thank you so very much. You've been an amazing panel. Thank you, Talia. Thank you, Omi, for your time, your insight, your transparency. I know there's a lot of questions that we were not able to get to today, um, but we this is going to be a continued conversation. So we thank you so much for you know helping us to to continue this conversation today. And uh, we would also SWHR would also like to thank um, sponsors. Um, Estella's Pharma, Bayer, Nutrafol, and Pfizer for their support of this event and SWHR's menopause program. We will be sending out um, an email with the recording of today's fireside chat to all registrants, as well as posting um, the recording on the event webpage for future viewing. So please be on the lookout for that and feel free to share with others. Um, there was, we've mentioned a survey, a workplace survey that SWHR had launched um, earlier this summer and we, um, if the data has not come back as far as results, we haven't disseminated, we're still pouring through. We thank everyone that participated and shared it. Um, and so we are going through and we're doing that data analysis. We would definitely be sharing that as it, um, as we comb through it and we have outtakes and insights and there's some materials that we're looking to develop with that data that we will share in various spaces, general spaces, but also um, with employers and policy spaces as well. It was just um, so much information, like we said, combining that data and that evidence with those anecdotes and those stories. And so we also understanding that women's um, individual experiences and health journeys help to inform providers and policy decision makers on critical gaps in women's health. SWHR invites you to share your story about menopause, narcolepsy, lupus, and other women's health topics by visiting swhr.org slash share your story. Uh, we also invite you to stay connected with us on social media as we continue this important conversation with hashtag SWHR Talks Menopause. For more information about menopause 
and other women's health topics, resources, events, or even to sign up for our newsletter, visit our website, swhr.org. And so, and as you can see here, we have this um, menopause preparedness toolkit that you can also find on our website and download. And it's also on our YouTube channel as well. Thank you for joining us. And uh, we look forward to continuing this conversation.